I'm just continuing part two of uh, the Samson series, and uh, this one I've titled The Angel of the Lord. And so um, I want to particularly uh, focus on and talk about this, this encounter that Samson's folks had um, with this mysterious character, the Angel of the Lord. He's a bit of a mysterious character. But hopefully I can unveil the mystery by the end of this uh, message and who he is. And it's in the context of uh, chapter 13 of the, the, the book of Judges. So we are, in a sense, still talking about Samson, but I'm just kind of like wanting to focus in on this particular person. So this should be uh, interesting. So I hope we can delve a little deeper into the identity of the angel of the Lord. Uh, so basically I looked at... Um, Judges chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. We only went through basically the first seven verses. So today I'm just going to just finish off that chapter. But to start off, I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of a recap previously in the Samson series. Um, So yeah, so there are four chapters that are dedicated to Samson in the book of Judges. Uh, And I believe that his life has much more to teach us about Christ and our redemption in him. And his life is not merely just a a cautionary tale, uh, but we can learn much about faith through his example. The book of Hebrews in chapter 11 uh, mentions him amongst those Old Testament uh, saints who walked by faith. Uh, Samson came to the world at a time when Israel had been ruled uh, and dominated by the Philistines. So they were the big bad enemy at that point. So this period in Israel's history was a very dark time. Uh, Israel's dark ages, if you will. And so the time of the judges, we see this recurring refrain that uh, again, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the evil that Israel were committing was idolatry. So they'd come to worship the gods of the peoples that were meant to have ousted from the land that God had promised them. So Israel was unfaithful to God. Israel was unfaithful to God, but God continued to be faithful to them. So whenever Israel cried out to him, God would send judges to deliver them from their oppressors. But Israel's fidelity to God only lasted as long as those particular judges were alive. So basically, uh, when they died, they would fall back into their old pattern of idolatry again. And so eventually it came to pass that God sent them a saviour that no one asked for. So God sent Samson to stir up the hornet's nest among the Philistines and to basically shake Israel out of their apathy. So by the time Samson had come on the scene, so by the time Samson had come on the scene, I think I might have... There we go. So by the time Samson came on the scene, Israel had pretty much accepted their lot in life. Uh, There were no revolts, no uprising against them. Um, So basically, there was no fight in them. Uh, There was no resistance. So basically, they resigned to their faith that they were destined to be ruled and subjugated by the Philistines. They did not cry out to God to save them, as was the case in the past, uh, when they had been oppressed by an enemy. And it seems that they were content with the status quo. Uh, They were just happy to avoid the Philistines. And later on in the following chapters, um, we see Samson is actually fraternizing uh, with the Philistines. But despite all of that, God had other ideas. You see, Paul the Apostle said, if we are faithless, he remains, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, and that's a good thing. So we praise God for that. Um, So in the book of Judges, the camera zooms in and shows us a man from a place called Zorah, a man named uh, Manoah from the tribe of Dan, and his wife, who was, she's never named, and was barren, she couldn't have children. Uh, Yet through this mysterious character, the angel of the Lord, he announces that they will give birth to a son, and he will begin to deliver Israel, Samson will be set apart from the womb as a Nazarite, as a Nazarite. 
And remember, I mentioned last time that a Nazarite is different from a Nazarene. A Nazarite is someone who actually takes a Nazarite vow of a separation unto God. A Nazarene is someone who's from Nazareth, like Jesus of Nazareth. He was from Nazareth. Um, okay, so let me read that again. Samson was to be set apart as a, as a Nazarite. Why? Because his mission was clear. He would begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And we all know about Samson's flowing locks. You know, he was never allowed to cut. So Samson, as far as a Nazarite calling was concerned, was a type of Christ. As a Nazarite to God, a Nazarite from the womb, holy, set apart to God or for God. Though our Lord Jesus was not a Nazarite himself, yet he was typified by the Nazarites as being perfectly pure from all sin, the sinless and perfect son of God and entirely devoted to the honour of his father. And I love what Matthew Henry said. He said, but our Lord Jesus is both Samson and David. He is both the author and the finisher of our faith. And Paul said, being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in us is able to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. And also we have the adoption, and that includes the redemption of the body, where we no longer have to be content or contend with the Philistines in our lives, the flesh that gets us into all kinds of trouble. It's problematic that we live in a body of flesh. Um, some of you may have heard about a greatly respected Christian apologist, I won't mention his name, <laughs> uh, who, re who recently in a full investigative uh, report turns out that he had been engaged in an ongoing sexual misconduct. He was engaged in ongoing sexual misconduct and it was greatly distressing for obviously the victims and for his family. And me personally, when I heard about it, I, I, I just couldn't believe it, kind of refused to believe it. But as the facts would have it, it turns out that it's true. But I'm not surprised when the flesh behaves like flesh but it's still shocking, uh, nevertheless. So the, fallout, the, so the fallout is real, and this gives the atheist or the unbeliever the opportunity to, to, to drag the name of Jesus through the mud, and that's, that's a, a, a sad kind of effect of this kind of behavior. So, but this is only one example, but a very public one, of not dealing with the Philistines in our lives and the idols or the coping mechanisms that result. Idols are a poor substitute for the joy and the contentment that is only found in our loving God and our loving Heavenly Father. Uh, you see, because, you know, I was just thinking about this, and with every little compromise here and there, you know, you're kind of yielding to the demands of, of the flesh and temptation, and eventually, if not checked or, or guarded against, you may find yourself doing things that would have repulsed you in the past. And so there comes a point where you cross like this, so there's like this invisible line, and some may even cross that line into criminal uh, activity. I'm talking about people who profess Christ, and you end up living a double life, uh, duplicitous, you know, even hypocritical, because you begin to accommodate the flesh instead of crucifying it. And it's no longer an occasional slip up, it becomes habitual, and it becomes a lifestyle. And you end up hiding, you know, hiding your secret sin or your lifestyle behind the scenes to protect your reputation. And that's a terrible place, you know, to find yourself in. So sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. And unfortunately for this person... He went to the grave with no signs of remorse for his behavior, having caused, I'd say, irreparable uh, damage to his name, which was highly reputable and respected amongst believers and unbelievers alike. But I'll say this. I'd say this. 
and my wife and I had this discussion as well. Um, if he genuinely believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and forgiveness of sins, and only the Lord knows for certain, he is saved. And he is in the presence of Jesus because we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. So I wanted to make, make that plain because I find that some believers are inconsistent and that they may profess that we are saved by grace, not by good works. But when something like this happens, they say that this person was never truly a believer. He was a fraud based on their behavior. But Paul said that where sin abounds, the grace of God abounds all the more. But we understand that sin has consequences and we see the devastating of the effect of the flesh when it is entertained. And only by God's grace can we overcome the flesh. Only by the finished work of the cross are we victorious. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And we have this hope. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right. I just thought I'd put that in there. Let's move on here. So basically the last time I mentioned that Samson's mother had added to the statement made by the angel of the Lord that he would be a Nazarite from the womb, she added to the day of his death. And I found this to be very interesting because it was almost like she had the spiritual insight from the beginning that Samson's Nazarite status, his consecration, the very person for the very purpose for why he was born, would be consummated in his death. So Israel was in a dark place, yet despite their wickedness, despite the fact that they had just accepted Philistine dominance without putting up a fight, God, because of his loving kindness and his grace towards his people, was to bring them a saviour anyway. And it was his death that would prove to be of utmost significance. Samson's mother had this revelation, I believe. And we can see the parallel. We can see the parallel in the uh, New Testament. Uh, where we have Mary's heart, her very soul, and the future would be pierced as with a sword as she held her baby son in her arms. Her mother's heart would break as she would have to endure to see her son Jesus go through the mocking, the beating, the, and ultimately his death on a Roman cross. His suffering would not leave her untouched, but also to recognize that his death would come, but with his death would come not only the deliverance or the redemption and salvation of Israel, but would also come the deliverance, redemption and salvation of the world, including the Gentiles. Obviously, the Gentiles would also be included in his sacrificial death. Amen. Okay. So let's move on. So now we're just going to move on from, from that. So now I'm just going to basically just begin to fill out the rest of the chapter here. But uh, at this point, I just want to basically look at the angel of the Lord. So here we go. Let's look at this one here. Okay, so the angel of the Lord, I've just put that scripture up. But... Um, so this guy, he's a, he's a mysterious character. I mean, who is this, this person who appears to Samson's parents? This man that the woman describes as very awesome. Uh, who is he? Why is he significant? The angel of the Lord carries in this air of, of mystery, and I've stated that about a hundred times. He seems to be more than just an angel. So as we move on in Judges 13, we see that the angel of the Lord appears first to Samson's mother and tells her, that though she is barren, she will have a son. Manoah, her husband, is not present at the time. And at this point, she calls the angel of the Lord a man of God. She did not question 
where he was from, neither did she ask his name. His countenance was like too awesome. I think she was afraid if she asked his name, she might not like the answer. Because I feel like uh, Samson's mother had this uh, spiritual sensitivity. She recognized that this man was, was somehow special, uh, perhaps even divine. I think she had an inkling about that. So she rushes to tell her husband, and he tells him the whole story of her encounter with the shining man of God. And this was Manoah's response. So Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us and teach us what we shall, what we shall do for the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Then the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has now just appeared to me. And I find that very funny because here we have Manoah. He prays to the man of God. Um, he, or he prays that the man of God would visit them again. He prays to God and God listens to his prayer. And then ironically, the angel of the Lord promptly appears to his wife. Not him. It happened twice. This is the second time. So essentially, Manoah was pretty clueless, right? Uh, he's been out of the loop. He's, he's supposed to be in charge. He's the head of the family. And, but I think it was his wife who had the spiritual discernment. I don't think he was the uh, sharpest tool in the shed, this guy. And I'm sure, husbands, um, that you've never been in a situation like Manoah before, when you ask the Lord for something and he gives you, your wife the answers or the faith to believe. And... Um, well, I'll tell you this. When, when Nat and I um, were going for a home loan, after the third rejection from the banks, through no fault of our own, of course, um, I was like, okay, we've been rejected three times. That's it. Uh, let's just cut our losses and uh, chill out. Let's just relax and then maybe we can recoup and, and live to fight another day. And, uh, but Nat was like, nah. I said, I'll, uh, I'll ask for an extension for the owner of the place that we were purchasing and try again. And uh, the fourth attempt, we got the loan. So we're actually homeowners. We're new homeowners at the moment. Yeah. All right. That was good. So we're really happy about that. So, but imagine if I had not listened to her. Or imagine if she had listened to me. Because I was clueless about what was going on. I was clueless about what God was also going to do for us. And in a sense, so was Manoah. So anyway, the angel of the Lord appears to the woman again. And so she rushes to tell her husband again. And, uh, and look, now they have, they have no idea who this person is at the time. Which is why they refer to him as the man of God. And it's actually the, the, the writer or the narrator of Judges that calls him the angel of the Lord. And so I'm going to come back to the narrative later, but now I just want to get into the, the thrust of my message today concerning the angel of the Lord. And eventually we'll just tie it all back into the narrative in Judges and finish it off and discover some wonderful truths about uh, the Lord Jesus too. So I want to first mention this in the old testament we have what we call types or shadows of christ so what is a type what is what they call biblical typology it's a good question i'm about to answer it so typology is a special kind of symbolism a symbol is something that represents something else so we can define a type as a prophetic symbol because all types are representations of something yet future. More specifically, a type in scripture is a person or thing in the Old Testament that foreshadows a person or thing in the New Testament. Um, I might read that again. More specifically, a type in scripture is a person or thing in the Old Testament that foreshadows a person or thing in the New Testament. 
For example, the flood of Noah's day in Genesis 6 uh, through to chapter 7 is used as a type of baptism in 1 Peter and that reference there. And the word for type that Peter uses is a word figure, like a figure of speech. So when we say that someone is a type of Christ, we are saying that a person in the Old Testament behaves in a way that corresponds to Jesus' character or actions in the New Testament. When we say that something is typical of Christ, we are saying that it is an object or an event in the Old Testament can be viewed as representative of some quality of Jesus. Uh, for example, we see Jesus pictured or typified as, uh, as the rock. The rock. Oh, no, that's not right. Who put this PowerPoint together? The rock that watered Israel in the wilderness. The rock that was Christ. Paul says that the rock who was Christ. Uh, the manna from heaven. We've got the manna from heaven that's typified of, of Christ. We've got the... Um, the serpent on the pole. I love that one. The serpent on the pole. People think, why was... Even Jesus said that even as the serpent was raised up in the desert on the, on the, on the pole. So it's kind of like, how was Jesus like? How was it that Jesus, the sinless Son of God, could be represented by the serpent? It's because Jesus became sin for us. And the Word of God says that He became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the bronze serpent on the pole typifies Christ. And then we have men in the Old Testament that typified Christ. We had Paul talks about Adam. He typified Christ. Ken preached a message on Joseph. Joseph is an awesome example of, uh, of, uh, of someone who, type, who was a type of Christ, Joseph. We have Jonah. Jonah actually typified the resurrection of Christ when we read that in the Gospels and obviously Melchizedek was also a type of Christ as well so in the book of Hebrews uh, the book of Hebrews looks at the tabernacle of Moses and even the, the, the temple the priesthood of Melchizedek the sacrificial system instituted under the law of Moses the Passover all these are pictures that typify Christ and the finish work so what does this have to do with samson what's this have to do with the angel of the lord um just kind of stay with me for a little bit and uh, hopefully it will start to make sense because now i'd want to introduce to you a couple of other terms a theophany and a christophany so what is a theophany a theophany is a manifestation of god in the Bible that is tangible to the senses. In its most restrictive sense, it is a visible appearance of God in the Old Testament period, but not always in human form. So basically, these are real world appearances of God in the Bible, where those who encountered God could tangibly detect God with their five physical senses. I mean, how awesome is that that they could hear God, see God, reach out and touch him in some way. So we remember Israel were led in the wilderness by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. So a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. That was a manifestation of God. That was a theophany. So here we have the scripture. It says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night so it was almost like during the day god gave them coverage as well like they had like air conditioning and heating and all that kind of cool stuff that they needed out in the wilderness out in the desert because during the day it's really hot and at night it's really cold so that was the grace of God right there. So notice it says, the Lord. You know, the word the Lord 
is the word Yahweh. That's the sacred name of God, Yahweh. The God who will be, who is, who has been, he who brings everything into existence, what exists, the great I am revealed to Moses in the burning bush. This is the same Lord that led them in the pillar of cloud and fire. That is what a theophany is. Now, in relation to the angel of the Lord character, I believe that he was not merely an angelic creature or an angelic being. I believe he was a Christophany. So what's a Christophany? A Christophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And I believe that most theophanies in the Old Testament were Christophanies. So this is the difference. This is why I brought this up. This is the difference between a type of Christ and a Christophany. A type foreshadowed and represented the coming of Christ and his finished work in redemption in the New Testament through symbols and pictures in the Old Testament. A Christophany was an actual appearance of the second person of the Trinity. Jesus, before he took on a human body and actually became human as a little baby in Bethlehem, before the Word had become flesh and dwelt among us. So if the angel of the Lord is not merely an angelic being, why is he called an angel? He's never called an angel of the Lord. He's called the angel of the Lord. It's singular with the definite article, the. So in the scripture, the angel of the Lord is unique. It's very unique. So I think, yep. So in Hebrew, he's called Malak Yahweh. The angel of the Lord, or also Malak Elohim, which is angel of God. And Malak is translated angel in the English, and in the Greek it's angelos, which is obviously where we get the word angel from. And it simply means messenger. An angel is not always an angelic creature or being. A Malak can also be a human messenger as well. And uh, as you see here, the noun Malak, messenger, is used 213 times in the Old Testament. In the historical books, uh, it's used many times. In Judges, it's, it's used 21, uh, 31 times. Second Kings, 20 times. First Samuel, 19 times. Second Samuel, 18 times. And in the prophetic books, or in the prophetic writings, it's not really used that much, except in the book of Zechariah. So basically, here the point is, so we have both human messages and supernatural messages. So I just wanted to talk quickly here on human messages in the Bible, which use that word malak. So malak speaks of someone sent from a great distance by an individual or a community, and there are also multiple messages. So here we have Jacob. Then Jacob sent messages before him to Esau, his brothers. So Jacob sent messengers. That word is malak. Before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, and he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. And so messengers would deliver the message as, the, as representatives of their master or king, usually containing the phrase, Thus saith, or this is what blah 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 blank says. Um, <laughs> Uh, as a representative of the king, they may have functioned also as a, like an ambassador right, or a diplomat. And so here we have an example here. Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together. Thirty-two kings were with him with horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it. Then he sent messengers. Were they angelic creatures, no, they were human messages, Malak, into the city of Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, thus says Ben-Hadad, your silver and your gold are mine and your loveliest wives and children are mine. Wow. Um, so, um, so basically what am I saying here? It says basically these verses are confirming the important place of messengers or the malak. So basically, honor to the messenger or the malak signified honor to the sender. So honor to the messenger signified honor to the sender. Obviously, the opposite is also true as well. You dishonor 
the sender by dishonoring the messenger. And wasn't that true when it came to God's prophetic messengers? Jesus said this to the religious leaders. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. So we have human messengers there. Okay. Supernatural messengers. This is quite interesting, I thought. Uh, angelic beings in general are called sons of God. Or in the Hebrew, Bene Elohim. So we've got a couple of references there in um, Genesis chapter 6 and Job chapter 1. But they're never um, addressed or called the sons of Yahweh. It's always sons of Elohim. Never the sons of Yahweh. Because the title Elohim, Mighty One, was used both of the true God and the gods of the heathen nations as well. So the title Yahweh was reserved for the God of Israel alone. The eternally self-existent one, the one who made the heavens and the earth and the God who entered into covenant with his people. And we see, oh, let's go back. So we see two angels sent to Sodom in Genesis. Now two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So basically these were two supernatural uh, beings that were sent by God to retrieve Lot and his family out of Sodom before the judgment of God fell on the city and that was so powerful that they struck the men trying to press into them and abuse them, struck them with uh, blindness. So we have looked at how the word Malak in Hebrew or angel in English can refer to human messages and angelic supernatural beings. You know, and Ken also spoke about uh, the, the, the angels of the seven churches. Some will also interpret, interpret that as uh, like the leaders or the pastors, like human leaders or human pastors of the uh, seven churches, not necessarily an angelic being. So when it comes to the angel of the Lord, however, what's interesting is that he is identified as Yahweh. He's identified as God, but yet he's distinct from Yahweh as well. So the relation between the Lord, Yahweh, and the angel of the Lord is often so close that it's difficult to separate the two when you look at the scripture. And so the first mention of the angel of the Lord is in Genesis 16 concerning Sarai's maidservant. We've all heard of uh, Hagar, and she was uh, basically, she ran away from a mistress. Her mistress was treating her harshly, and so she just bolted, she ran away. Um, mainly because she despised her mistress, and she was, Sarai just wasn't having that. So basically she just took off, ran off. And this is where she ended up. Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord God said, or the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, I have also seen him who sees me. So was the angel of the Lord just merely speaking on behalf of God? Or is he identifying himself as God? When Hagar met the angel of the Lord, she realized she had seen God himself in a theophany. But more importantly, God saw her which is why she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. And the only one who spoke to her was the angel of the Lord. He called him El Roy, the God who sees. The God who sees. So that's really interesting how he is identified with God, Yahweh, this angel. So another example is one we all know, especially if you've seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and the burning bush. Um, 
Actually, I'll tell you a story. Um, years ago, Charlton Heston came to the Gold Coast and uh, he had like a function. It was a function, black tie kind of function. And uh, my mates and I at the time, we loved Tanker Moms, we loved Charlton Heston, and so we actually, we actually got tickets to go to this event. And anyway, my mate Lance uh, almost killed Charlton Heston uh, at that meeting. And what, hap what happened was he was, uh, he was asking for a photo. So I was actually standing like this. So he was actually asking for a photo. And he said, uh, Mr. Heston, my friend is over there. Could you like just, we just want to take a picture, get a picture taken. And anyway, my mate Lance was holding onto his hand and kind of abruptly pulled him forward. And then he had this like, this like groan came out of Charlton Heston. And he was like, oh, like this. And my mate kind of freaked out. And so ever after that, that whole experience, we kind of think, man, remember that time when you almost killed Charlton Heston? <laughs> and we just laughed at it. <laughs> but it was a great night. But uh, anyway, except for that part when he almost got killed. But we've got, uh, oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. So anyway, we've got here. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame. This was Moses. From the midst of the bush. And so he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And what's interesting in that verse is that um, it says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame from the fire in the midst of the bush. But then it was God that spoke out of the midst of the bush. So th this one used to always confuse me when I used to read it. Because it says the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush. Then it says God called him from the midst of the bush. So who was it that called out of the bush? Was it God or was it the angel of the Lord? And the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> so what's my point? Well, my point is that these passages, it is clear that the angel of the Lord is identifying himself as God. So I heard someone say Jesus. And what's also interesting is that not only does he identify himself as God, but in other passages of the Bible, it's almost like he's also distinct from God as well speaks of himself in the first person then the third person and it's like uh, what's going on here so he is identifying himself as god but also distinct from yahweh as well so when we look at the parallel with the person of christ in exodus 3 it continues let's look at this verse this is a parallel to what christ said then moses said to god indeed when i came to the children of israel and say to them the god of your fathers has sent me to you and they say to me, oh, so the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am sent me to you. Now someone just called out that this person is Jesus. Jesus said this most famously. He said, most assuredly I say to you, that before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was identifying with the sacred name of God, Yahweh, the great I am, which the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Which is why the religious leaders, the Pharisees, wanted to kill him for blasphemy, for calling himself Yahweh. The great I am. Um, they knew what he was claiming to be. They, they knew who he was claiming to be, which is why they wanted to pick up stones and, and kill him. So we see in Zechariah, this is another passage, that the angel of the Lord intercedes to Yahweh. So this passage shows how he is distinct from God as well. So it says, The angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah? against which you were angry these 70 years. And the Lord answered the angel and talk, 
who talked to me with good and comforting words. With good and comforting words. So here we see that the angel of the Lord is interceding to God on behalf of Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. So there are two distinct persons here. And then we see that Yahweh the Lord answers the angel. So there are two distinct persons. The angel of the Lord is praying to God and so forth. So this is back and forth. But what uh, we see in the New Testament is where Jesus makes intercession for us to the Father. And I just found that just totally fascinating. Here in the book of Hebrews it says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Uh, interesting point is that the angel of the Lord never appears in the pages of the New Testament. He may be mentioned, I think he is mentioned by Stephen in the book of Acts, when he's actually talking about the burning bush um, account. But he never appears. He never actually appears because, why is that? Because he's Christ. He's Jesus in the New Testament. God revealed as an actual human being, not just in the form of a man. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like why uh, Superman and Clark Kent are never in the same room at the same time. It's because they're the same person. <laughs> they're the same person. You, oh, sorry, man, I ruined it for you. <laughs> I reckon if Phil took off his glasses, he'd be uh, Superman. But anyway. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> Stone him. Um, okay, so these passages of Scripture would be confusing and difficult to kind of put together or reconcile if we didn't have an understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. That God is one God revealed or manifested in three distinct persons, co-equal, co-eternal, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what have we learned about the angel of the Lord? He's unique, not merely a type or shadow of Christ or merely an angelic supernatural being. He is considered a Christophany or a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. He is identified with God, with Yahweh, yet distinct from God and from Yahweh. Henry C. Thyssen said this, the oft phrase, the angel of the Lord, as found in the Old Testament, has special reference to the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity. Okay, with all that info, <laughs> I just wanted to bring it home. And let's uh, go back to Judges chapter 13. Now that we know a little bit more of the angel of the Lord, who appeared to Samson's parents. So, where do we leave off? And I will pray to the Lord because he wanted to know what he was to do and how he was to raise the child. He was in no way getting second-hand information from his wife. And remember that God answered his prayer, but rather than appearing to him, he appeared to his wife. His wife tells him that the man of God appeared to her again, so he follows her back to this person, and thankfully he's still there in the field. So the scripture says, So Manoah rose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Manoah said, Let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life in his work? Just cut straight to the chase. So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. May she not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So he asks this question about how, how are we to raise this, this boy? And he said, well, I've told your wife, but okay, I'll tell you again. So the angel of the Lord is basically just saying, just listen to your wife. I've told her everything you need to know. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and we will prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, though you detain me, I will not eat your food. 
I have no idea why he wouldn't eat his food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? And when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. So Manoah look, uh, took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it, up to, uh, offered it up on the rock to the Lord. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground when, they, when the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. They had an inkling, but they weren't too sure. But when that happened, that amazing event happened, they knew it. They knew he was divine. And there's such, there's a lot of good stuff in that, just those verses. And uh, so, basically, Manoah was not getting the point that who he was dealing with here was God himself, the divine. He was having an actual encounter with God, but he just wasn't getting it. The penny was just not dropping. And obviously Manoah, being hospitable, asked if the man would like to have dinner. The angel of the Lord basically says, no thanks. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. Then it says, makes that statement. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. But unlike his wife, who I'd say wears the um, spiritual discernment pants in that relationship, was uh, smart enough to recognize that this man was divine and appropriately she did not ask questions concerning where he came from or his name. And I think Manoah was just getting a little bit frustrated and just wanted to know who he was and what he was to do. So he blurts out, what is your name? So that when your words come to pass, we may honour you. You know, at best, maybe Manoah thought he was a prophet. He may have thought. But I love the angel of the Lord's response. Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Which can mean, A, I'm not telling you my name. B, even if I tell you, you wouldn't understand it anyway. Or C, I am the wonder-working God of the Exodus awesome and glorious deeds and wonders i'm going for option c and then to top it all off this man whose name is wonderful does a wondrous thing in their presence as manoah and his wife watch in verse 20 this man ascends up in the altar fire and is seen no more his work is done it is finished like our Lord Jesus, once the angel of the Lord had done what he was sent to do, he left dramatically. We know Jesus ascended into heaven after the resurrection. So he left dramatically in the flame of a sacrificial offering to the Lord. What he told Benoah and his wife was sufficient, was enough. Done once, never to be repeated. This also reminded me of the words of Paul. Oh, that's a picture there. I forgot about that. Ascending up. Let's just look at that for two seconds. Okay, move on. This reminded me when the angel ascended up in the fire and in the flame. When Paul says, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And then we see... In Isaiah, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So once the angel of the Lord had gone, it was only then that Manoah and his wife realized who he was. Not just a man of God, but the angel of the Lord. They may have heard stories passed down to them 
about the appearance of this divine person or this divine messenger to Hagar. He appeared to Abraham. He appeared to uh, Gideon, who encountered the angel of the Lord under the terebinth tree. Seems like sometimes the angel of the Lord appears with trees. And I always kind of think to myself, oh, yeah, there's a, there could be a type or a correlation there where, where Christ was crucified on a tree. A terebinth tree is basically just a sturdy, hard tree like an oak. Some translations translate it as oak. But we see that Jesus was crucified on a tree. That's just something I just thought I'd mention. And so we have Joshua's encounter with the commander of the army of the Lord. Did you know that Jesus said, he said uh, when he was being arrested, he said to his disciples, don't do anything. Do you not know that I have the power to unleash, to unleash legions of angels? I have legions of angels at my disposal. So I believe that whom Joshua encountered was also Christ because he is the captain or the commander of the armies of the Lord. Even the false prophet Balaam and his talking donkey who stopped him from being struck down by the angel of the Lord. Maybe they'd heard of these stories, but never in a million years did they ever believe or think that they would encounter this angel of the Lord, this divine person. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, she, she's wise, you know, right? If the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted our burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as, as these at this time. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahane Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. So now, according to this passage, Manoah knows that the angel, who the angel of the Lord, that, that guy, that person, that character, that messenger is the angel of the Lord. And he well, he well knows something else as well. That he's seen God and now he thinks he's going to die because no one can see God's face and live. You know, we see that uh, Exodus 33, 20. You know, Moses actually asks to see God's glory. Remember that? But... He only got to see God's back parts because you can't see God's face and live. But all of God's goodness passed by Moses. So Moses came the closest to seeing God in all of his power and glory. But if he were to see the face of God, he would have just, you know, like in uh, the, the, uh, the Avengers movie, you know, the snap, you know, everyone just kind of just turns to ash, you know what I mean? In the presence of God. And uh, that's why I think God appeared as a theophany in the Old Testament so as not to obliterate people with his unrestrained power and glory. God would appear in like a human safe way. And this might explain when John said, that's the glory of God. And John said, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. That is, no one has ever seen God in all of his restrained glory and power. Jesus has always been the one who represented the Father on earth which is why I believe most, if not all, appearances in the Old Testament of God and Theophanies is Christ himself. Because Paul said that Jesus is the, is the visible image of the invisible God. The angel of the Lord, he was the unique, he was the unique angel of Yahweh in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus is the unique son of God. Jesus said to Philip, well, actually, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, 
and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show you the Father? It's amazing. Jesus has always been the one who was the connection between heaven and earth. And like Paul the Apostle said, he said, there is only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And anyway, just to finish up, we see Manoah. He's, uh, he's freaked out. He thinks he's going to die. And, you know, his logic is valid as far as it goes. Uh, his fear seems to be well-founded, but again, his wife's logic is better. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. Exactly. The fact that they didn't drop dead instantly was proof that their offering was accepted and why he could tell them that the woman would miraculously give birth to a son and then, and as opposed to just killing them off, right? So as I close, um, Samson's uh, entrance in, into the world was, was very miraculous. Samson had a, no doubt had a good start. Um, and I mean, he was, I mean, basically God was announcing his birth through the angel of the Lord. Samson was blessed. The spirit of God was mightily upon him. And he had good parents who wanted and desired to raise him the way that the Lord wanted them to. So on that note, I'll continue next time but in, in the series of Samson. But I'll leave it there. And we'll pray. We'll pray.